So we're uh, covering what well, time it is to cover Second Corinthians chapter make tonight and the, the last point which is our <clears throat> objective, talk about being separated, about the church being separated from the cultures and the, the, the darkness around us really is built upon an earlier point that Paul makes. And so I want to ask part of chapter 5 and just see if we can pick it up there. If somebody... Just, who, Jonathan, you want to read? You're trying to look away so I didn't pick on you? <laughs> Suggest that there's two parties involved. There's a grieved a, a party, one that's been offended. Now, a lot of times in a third, in, in a reconciliation process, there'll be in what's supposed to be an impartial third party that gets involved in the process. They come in and they. Say, start throwing out suggestions, maybe doing some negotiations. It's like, why don't you, the offender, do this for the offended? And why don't you, as the offended, accept this? And maybe we can work this thing out. What's so remarkable and astonishing about the reconciliation between us and God is that the aggrieved party took the initiative to do the work of reconciliation. It's it's unbelievable. There's no third party necessary. The offended took the steps to reach out to the offend offenders, which is us, and offer a process by which we could be reconciled back to God, even in in the face of our of our offense. It's 100 percent the mercy and grace of a loving God. But what's interesting is that as in verse 20 that he's making an appeal as an ambassador of God, as one who was called by God and sent by God and ended up in Corinth. He says, I'm making an appeal to you. Be reconciled to God. Which tells me that there's something of a human response necessary to this work that God did in order to make it effective. Well, what's the point of making an appeal if that's not the case? There's no, you know, it's 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 useless rhetoric. It's, you know, so you, well, I'm going to make an appeal for you guys to be reconciled even though there's not a darn thing you can do about it. It's, it's like, no, there's something and the human response. And if we delve into it a little bit, you find out that in the, in the structure of Greek verbs, there's what they call passive verbs, which means um, that when, when Paul says, he, and he calls out and, and asks the Corinthians, appeals to them to be reconciled, What he's really saying is, allow God to reconcile you. It's a passive thing. They they can really do nothing. They can take no action to reconcile themselves. So he's not asking them to do something to be reconciled. He's asking them to accept the reconciliation that God has offered and allow God to reconcile you back to himself because he's really the only one that can do it. So there's no action they can do. There's no gyrations, you know, no, um, yeah, no, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, nothing. You can't beat yourself into it. You can't, you know. But there's an appeal to allow it to happen, to accept the reconciliation that God is offering and allow him to reconcile you back to himself. So that this whole process is God initiated, it's it's God accomplished, it's God made, 
but the human response is to embrace it or to accept it. In Romans 5, Paul talks about the same thing. You know, you were enemies of God. You aligned yourself with God's enemies and you put yourself in a position of being his enemy. Now accept his reconciliation. So same kind of thing, a real passive verbiage that's used there that just receive it. Allow yourself to be reconciled back to God by God. But it still is, is a response. It's a response of faith. Right? Making sense. So we have Paul as this apostolic ambassador um, and saying, be reconciled to God. God has done everything for you for, the, for, it, to, for it to be possible. You just need to accept it. Now, this appeal is coming from a guy who, if you remember, is being kind of questioned by the Corinthians. He's being kind of bad-mouthed by some of the guys, the other guys who are coming into the city. And, and, and his concern is, you guys, you guys are in danger of receiving the grace of God in vain. God's grace has called Paul that called, you know, he, he, would, he, he would know of himself that I've been called by God to come to you. I was sent by God to come to you, and I brought you the message of reconciliation. You're in the faith because I came to you first and, and brought this message. You're in danger of letting that grace of God be shown in vain by rejecting me and rejecting and, and accepting these other guys who are kind of corrupting and polluting the message. And so his exhortation to them is don't, <clears throat> don't let that happen. Sorry, guys, something in here got me a little while ago, some allergic reaction, and I can't seem to completely shake it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So his warning to them is um, don't, don't receive the grace of God in vain. Don't let it be wasted on you by turning away. It's almost like Jesus was talking about sent out his disciples and said, you know, when you go out, proclaim the gospel, anybody who doesn't receive you is not receiving me. And if they don't receive you, shake the dust off and go away. And Paul's really saying, look, you came into the faith through me. I am the apostle God sent to you. If you reject me, you are rejecting the work of God, and it's a very dangerous ground to be walking on. So their, their acceptance of, of God and their right standing with God requires them to be in good standing with Paul, if that makes sense. They can't reject Paul <clears throat> without sinning against the grace of God if that makes sense. And so he's making that appeal. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Don't abandon the grace. Don't abandon the faith, your faith, by rejecting God's gracious gift to you of this word of reconciliation, which he brought about through us, through, through, through me. Dangerous, you know. He's leave it at that. He wants them to reconciliation. God is offered to them through the sacrificial death and Christ. Peter makes a comment and says, "You, you know, your reconciliation, your redemption, your redemption comes not." Through things like silver and gold, but by something far more precious, the precious blood of, of Christ. It's a serious thing <clears throat> to turn away from that once you've been brought into it, like the Corinthians had. So in order to, <clears throat> and we'll just jump through some of these verses real quick here, uh, in chapter 6, verses 3 through 10, Paul's giving the credentials of an apostolic ministry. <clears throat> Yeah. And he 
he's, what he's really doing is saying, I'm qualified to bring you this message as a true apostle. Apostolic credentials, let's just go through them real quickly in these verses. And the accompanying hardships of being it are you have to exhibit great endurance. You're going to suffer afflictions, hardships, distress, beatings, imprisonment, riots. We know there was riots in Ephesus when Paul was there. And in Jerusalem, it's going to be there's going to be sleepless nights, and you're going to go hungry. And Paul's his testimony is, I've message to you guys. The they have to do these things with, and they have to show kindness to have the presence of God or the Holy Spirit with them. Sincere love and truth. Again, I've I've done all that. I've done all that to you guys. And these things are performed with or through weapons of righteousness, through glory and dishonor. Paul's had both. He's He's had his moments of glory and he certainly had his moments and, and through bad reports and good reports. And what Paul's really saying is, I've done this. <clears throat> I bear in my body the marks of a true apostle. I'm not just another windbag coming into town and just trying to get you to believe some, my opinion about things. I am called, chosen, and sent by God. When Paul was called, the first thing that God said to him was, I've come to tell you how much you're going to suffer for me. And he did. He suffered for the sake of the gospel. Then in verses 11 and thir- through 13 of chapter 6, Paul just really makes a heartfelt appeal to the Corinthians to be reconciled back to him. Don't reject as it's too serious for you to, it's, it's a serious step for you to take. Just like you're reconciled to God, be reconciled to me. Don't don't turn your hearts away. And now we get to the point of um, that he's really trying to build up to, which comes out in um, verse 14 of chapter 6 through verse 1 of chapter 7. I'm trying to decide if we could if we could read it. Nick, can you just read that for us real quickly? Start in 614 and read through verse 1 of chapter 7. Okay. Okay, so what Paul has done is he's come in and he said, made it to God. This section where he says, I, 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 I am called a true apostle. I need to be appealed to. This is coming up to your appropriate response from Corinth, from the dark defilement of Corinth, which they're being tempted to go back into. What he's really saying is, as the children of God, you cannot be joined to these things. Do not be bound with unbelievers. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, first of all, what's an unbeliever? Paul, in, in the first letter to Corinth, wrote and told them, you know, hey, it's, it's okay if unbelievers come into your midst. They're going to they're gonna come in. We want them to come in. I didn't tell you to never talk to an unbeliever. I didn't tell you to, you'd have to leave the planet if you were, if you were going to do that. You can, I would suggest you don't marry an unbeliever. If, if you're not married to one, if you are a Christian and you're married to an unbeliever, I would recommend you don't leave them because they might, they might come around. So he's not saying don't ever talk to an unbeliever. It's something he's gonna, we're going we're gonna to talk real quickly about is some, something deeper than that, something more, more meaningful than just you know, having interactions with the unbelieving world. If we didn't do that, how could Mark talk to the lady at work or his friend at work if we if we didn't have interactions with unbelievers? 
Well, when and Paul talk, believe it or not, the only place in, in Paul's letters that the term for unbeliever is used is in First um, and Second Corinthians. It's the only that's the only place that you'll that you'll find it. And and what we find is what he's talking about um, is people walking in a really dark place. You're talking about the people. Corinth was, you know, the landscape of Corinth was was dotted with with idol idol temples, right? In Paul's first letter, he he says, "Don't have any fellowship. Don't have um, any kind of partnership." In this letter, he says, "Don't have partnership or fellowship with unbelievers." In the first letter, when he's talking about the fellowship, what he was really talking about was, "Don't go in and share." The, the idolatrous meals in the temple. Don't go in and participate in the idolatrous, uh, immoral worship that was going on in these temples to these foreign gods. You, as a believer, cannot be joined to the unbeliever in that way. There's an unequally or an unequal yoking that happens. If you try to do that, you as a believer are filled with the Holy Spirit, with the spirit of the living God, he says, and collectively you're the temple of of God. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Unbelievers are full of darkness and idolatry. There should be no partnership, no communion, no fellowship. The word for, for partnership here means a sharing in or a communion with, and and Paul's just saying there can't you can't share in the things of darkness that these people participate in. You can't have communion with that. You can't go to the to the idol temples. You can't eat of the the temple meals that are you know that have been offered uh, to the idols. The, the fellowship is the word we're probably all familiar with, just koinonia. It's, it's talking about the kind of uh, fellowship that that we are are encouraged to have as believers among ourselves, sharing the spirit and sharing our faith and sharing our, if you want to think of it as our religious activities, we're encouraged to do those things. And Paul's saying, you're not to do that with the unbeliever. There's no common ground between the spirit. One of them, believers, um, believers are, share, are following Christ. Unbelievers are following Belial or, or Satan. Believers are righteous. Unbelievers are, are wicked, licentious, or um, you know, lawless. I think he says here in the New American Standard, there's the, the distinctions are obvious. There's no communion that can happen, no spiritual or religious communion that can come out of that. And this is what the Corinthians were trying to do. And I would say, I would suggest to you that there are elements of the church today that are trying to do something very similar. They're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to have communion with darkness and, and still be walking in still claim to be walking in the light. That's a better way to say it. And what does Paul say about believers and unbelievers? Believers are in the light of the truth. Unbelievers are in the domain of darkness. All these things are listed in those verses that Nick just read for us. So when you add it up, you can see that what Paul really views as unbelievers are those who are walking in darkness, blinded in their minds. They're not in the light of the truth. They're blind. They're walking and groping. They're wicked and, and lawless. They're serving Satan. They're worshiping idols. You're serving Christ. What union can possibly be? What common ground can you find there to have partnership or fellowship with, with, a, with that kind of uh, thing? And this is, what, this is what Paul's really telling them. You've got to separate yourself from those things. There's choices to be made. You can't participate in some of the things that they do. And I think this is something that we just all need to follow the leading of the Spirit 
in us, you know, because I know that I can, I can only anticipate that people are thinking, well, what does that mean to us? What can I do and what can I not do? And I would suggest that you probably know. And if you don't and you're confused, talk to a, a friend or a brother because it's, it's, sometimes it's easier, it's easier for Vic to see what I shouldn't do than it is for me to see it because I can get confused by my emotions or my heart or whatever, you know, and I just need to <clears throat> ask somebody for help. But we know, for the most part, we know I am participating or having fellowship with something I shouldn't be having fellowship if I go down that path. Most of the time, we know it, right? And this is Paul's, what Paul is saying is because God has reached out to you, God has done the work and taken the initiative of reconciling us back to himself, we should, by, it should be the, the response of our heart the appropriate response is separate yourself from the world. And the promises that are, that are here that, that Paul uses Old Testament verses to bring out is that God says, when you do that, I'll be a father to you. You'll be my children. You'll be my sons. You'll be my daughters. This is a promise that Paul's drawn probably from Leviticus. Um, and, or, or, and just saying, you know, God is delighted for us to be restored back to him, to be reconciled back to him and his promises, I will be a father to you and I will dwell with you, which is phenomenal. It's the first fruits of what's going to happen in the eschaton, in, in, the, in the new age, when the tabernacle of God is now with men, made among men, and God and man dwell together in perfect unity the way we were intended to do from the beginning before we got separated by the by the fall we have the first fruits of that communion in the spirit right now we are the temple of the living god and it's the promise of complete communion with god at some time in the future and as those people as that community of people we should separate ourselves from the unrighteousness, from the darkness of this planet and walk in in truth, in light. And I'll just, I'll finish by reading again. Listen to verse 1 of chapter 7 in light of all these, those things. Therefore, having these promises that God will be your father, you'll be his children, it's a, this is the covenantal promise. Uh, Paul is drawing from God's words to David in, in 2 Samuel that, you know, I will make him my son. I will have a covenant with him. He'll be, my, he'll be my son and I will be his God. We have, Paul is saying these promises extend to us. So having those promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Can't be said any better. That's, that's, what, that's what we're called to do. And that's what we're called to be. So we kind of blasted through that. Hope it made sense. Hope is encouraging. God is a good God. We sang songs tonight about him, uh, you know, about being his sons and, and daughters and, and how good, how he wants to redeem us and reconcile us. and It's amazing, guys. It's amazing that we, as these far inferior beings who offended a mighty, far superior being, and that he reaches out to us to reconcile us back to himself. It's phenomenal. It's... It's... Um, it's a story. We are the recipient. We are the ones that have been made into the righteousness of God by the reconciliation process that God did. Right? Amen. He's given us the ministry 
the ministry to reconcile others, right? All right. Yeah. Amen. So let's just pray real quickly and we'll, we'll close. Lord, again, we're just so humbled by your amazing grace. God, um, man, we are so grateful, Lord, that, that you, as the one offended, reached out to bring us back to yourself, to reconcile us back to you. And Lord, we want to be grateful. We want to be, um, well, we just want to, we want to accept it. We want to believe your promises. We want you to be our father. We want to be your children. And Lord, as much as possible, we want to be messengers of your reconciliation. And we do pray, Lord, as we were asking earlier, Like Vic said, why can't we see your power here? And why can't we see your redemptive arm working here among our friends, among our family, among our neighbors, Lord? Why can't we be the ones that you send with the word of reconciliation, with with the good news that you've that you've given to us. The good news that we walk in, why, why can't we take that word effectively to those around us, Lord? We just, we pray that these things could be true. And God, I pray you move in our hearts, move in our minds to understand how to pray about these things. Move on our hearts to have a desire to pray for these things so that you would receive the glory that you deserve from the lost around us, Lord. And that we would get the joy of seeing them come into the light. We just want to partner with you as, and be co-workers with you, God, in this, in this work of reconciliation. And we offer ourselves to you and ask that you would lead us in that way. And we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.